Today I'm going to be talking about something that grows out of my dissertation project, which I finished in 2019, and I'm now slowly starting to work towards a book manuscript. So um, some of you, I'm sort of, I'm an anthropologist with strong leanings or orientations towards cultural geography, and this project is about the neighborhood of Tamel in Kathmandu, Nepal. And I was pleased to see um, in the registration list that many of you will probably already have some familiarity with Tamel. Um, even for those of you who don't, don't worry, I try to give enough context that I hope it'll still make sense. Um, and even for those of you who do, part of my point is that there's a strong chance that um, your primary association with Tamel has something to do with foreignness or tourism. And what I want to present today is kind of an alternative history, an alternative cultural dynamic to Tamel that hopefully challenges that. Um, as I said, so the as I enter the, the second half of my fellowship here in Leiden, I'm increasingly turning towards the possibility of writing a book manuscript out of what my dissertation became. So in this presentation, I'm taking a slightly broader view of Tamel, um, which I hope is enjoyable, but what gets lost or what, what that threatens to do is lose some of the depth and nuance. So as Anne-Marie said, I wanna encourage anyone, if I kind of gloss over something or it seems like I'm sort of steamrolling through a topic too quickly to get to the next thing, feel free even as I'm talking to drop a question into the chat and then hopefully we can get a little deeper into the the nitty gritty details of that during the Q&A session after the formal presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm just gonna launch in here and quickly, just for those of you who have no understanding of Tamil or have never been there, have no associations with it, this is a pretty sort of densely packed, deeply global, transnational, cosmopolitan enclave in Kathmandu, sort of on the northern edge of the, of the old city. So here we go. The neighborhood of Tamel has a variety of conflicting reputations among diversely positioned subjects. It is a crowded and global enclave in Kathmandu, Nepal, one that yields divergent experiences and significance. Its collection of live music venues, guest houses, hustlers, eclectic restaurants, shops, and dance clubs makes it exceedingly difficult to pin down to any one narrative. The neighborhood produces different experiential effects among the tourists, workers, and Nepali consumers who move through the neighborhood, each pursuing diverse cultural and economic projects. Walking into the neighborhood without context or even with context can be a disorienting experience, a sensory overload, an onslaught of discordant cultural inputs. One of my aims here is to begin unpacking this diversity and to make sense of how the superposition of social worlds in Tamel is itself productive. Tamel is variously described, depending on who you ask, as a tourist place, a liberating enclave, a criminal underbelly, an indigenous Newar settlement, a shopper's haven, an ancient space embedded in the spiritual mandala of medieval Kathmandu, a commercial zone of lucrative opportunity, a threat to traditional values, and more. Depending on who one asks and who is doing the asking, Tamel can either be a harbinger of modern Nepali cosmopolitanism or an albatross of cultural decline. These divergent experiences emerge from intersecting positions of class, caste, nationality, gender, and generation as these groups come into particular relationship with the neighborhood. In particular, in this presentation, I wanna highlight the cultural politics embedded in such relationships. In other words, the way that contestations over Tamel reflect and engage broader discourses about acceptable Nepaliness itself in the 21st century. So I'm gonna begin with a brief history of Tamel and its prevailing but also misleading reputation as a quote unquote tourist place. Following that, I'll briefly discuss the theoretical side of the work, which has increasingly brought me away from my dissertation and towards assemblage theory and what I'm tentatively calling compositions here. Then I'll turn to three key issues in the project that highlight some of the Nepali dimensions of the space. 
cosmopolitanism, the practice of place, and transnational circulation. Taken together, this will flesh out the overall story I'm trying to advance here. Namely, that the neighborhood of Tamel is an assemblage of diverse things, people, and discourses. And as people come into relationship with that assemblage, they both alter its competition, composition and are altered by it. One central argument is that emergent forms of identity performance require new spaces, new spatialities, and that these new spaces and identities are constantly, inevitably in motion. So before I get to this slide, Tamil actually has a much, much deeper history than this going back over a millennium. Um, and it's a history full of mythology and trans Himalayan traders and religious pilgrims and political intrigue. And I'm happy to get into any of that again during the Q&A. But for our purposes now, the story of modern Tamil begins about 50 years ago. Before that, most people considered the area a kind of peripheral backwater in Kathmandu. This began to change with the opening of the Kathmandu Guest House around 1970. As Mark Lichty and others have written, the Kathmandu Guest House picked up on broader economic and political currents to help usher in a new sort of middle-class adventure tourism in Nepal. And this is still the brand that dominates the country's tourism industry today. In the decades after the Kathmandu Guest House opened its doors, the roads and alleys stretching in all directions filled in with more hotels, restaurants, pubs, travel agencies, and souvenir shops. By the 1990s, Tamil had earned its touristic reputation. It was the area of the city best known as a hub for backpackers, trekkers, and middle-class tourists of all sorts. You can actually see this transformation almost in real time in characterizations in guidebooks from that period. So the first edition of this guidebook on the screen, Trekking in the Annapurna Region, published in 1993, reads, quote, most travelers find Tamel the most convenient area to stay in, although it's rapidly becoming something of a tourist ghetto. By the second edition, published three years later in 1996, the wording had already changed. Quote, most travelers find Tamel the most convenient area to stay in, although it's now largely a tourist ghetto. So by the mid 90s, this characterization of the neighborhood as a tourist hub, a backpacker's ghetto had firmly taken hold. Today, the bustling neighborhood has over 4,000 businesses, many of which are oriented towards tourism. At the same time, this discourse of tourism and foreignness smuggles in a whole suite of cultural politics surrounding what constitutes quote unquote authentic Nepali culture. This quote from the 2009 Lonely Planet uh, exemplifies this. In an introduction to Tom L, they write quote, Enjoy the internet cafes, the espresso, and the lemon cheesecake, but make sure you also get out into the real Nepal before your time runs out. This trope that Tamil is somehow separate from its city and country still pervades contemporary Kathmandu. It remains the most common lens through which the neighborhood is interpreted. But I want to be clear that this isn't just a matter of tourists misrepresenting Tamil or tourist texts misrepresenting Tamil. It's also common among Nepalis, particularly older Nepalis, as well as foreign scholars. One study of street children in the city, for example, says about Tamil, quote, it either captivates or irritates. And even if it doesn't represent Nepal, it feels compulsory to transit through it for those who want to enter the country. The prevailing assumption, in other words, is that Tamil overwhelmingly caters primarily to tourists, that it represents a foreign imposition in the city, and that the quote unquote real Nepal resides somewhere else. The tide seems to be turning on this, but it's hard to overstate the degree to which Tamil's reputation is still tethered to foreignness and relatedly perceived inauthenticity. But this is only one of Tamil's uh, overlapping and ongoing realities, and it has waned in relative importance over the past decade or two. Today, Nepali consumers in Tamil, of which there are many and ever more coming, outnumber and outspend tourists, and their practices are generally not that concerned with foreigners. 
this was true even before COVID-19 effectively halted Nepal in the past year, excuse me, effectively halted tourism in Nepal over the past year. But however misleading, what this prevailing discourse does is police cultural boundaries. Nepali consumers in Tamil frequently get written off as acting foreign or of not being really Nepali. This of course relies on an essentialist understanding of culture as something bounded, static, and internally coherent. The tourist place trope renders Nepalese out of place in their own city, but it is also just descriptively inaccurate. There are simply too many things going on in Tamil and too many experiences not reducible to a story of foreign incursion. Tamil is a tourist place in the sense that it was initially developed to cater to foreigners and is still one of the most renowned landing pads for backpackers in South Asia. But this is an increasingly peripheral part of the story. Dispensing with the tourist place trope raises a whole host of other questions. And that's really the challenge that my project takes up to document the multiple ways Nepalis engage with Tamil, and furthermore, to understand how the space itself reproduces and fosters cultural transformation. However one views and experiences the neighborhood, Tamil is generally perceived as exceptional relative to other spaces of the city, whether liberating or degrading, immoral or aspirational, Tamil has become a spatial signifier of difference and transgression within Kathmandu's contemporary cultural geography, and even beyond the city and the diaspora, as we'll see later on. Crossing the physical boundary into the space of Tamil often entails crossing cultural boundaries as well. It is simultaneously a setting, a stage, a reflection, and a generator of new subjectivities and contested identities. I'm not gonna to spend too much time here talking about my theoretical uh, framework for analyzing Tamil, which is still sort of in process. But um, here in Leiden, I've increasingly started torn, turning towards assemblage thinking to conceptualize Tamil. And this is where the term compositions in the title comes from. By composition, I mean something really similar to assemblage, yet in a way that especially highlights meaning making processes. Tamil is certainly a material assemblage of buildings, of bodies, of commodities, of paperwork, but the meaning and experience of that assemblage shifts depending on factors not wholly reducible to material forms. Composition is meant to evoke artistic connotations. A piece of music is an assemblage of timbres, tones, and frequencies that are arranged to create a larger whole. A painting, for example, is an assemblage of pigments and canvas. And yet such an artistic composition achieves new and divergent sorts of meanings through new frames of interpretation and experience. If machines are a favorite way of conceptualizing assemblages for people like Deleuze and Gotari, compositions emphasize that such assemblages also attain new significance as people encounter them. The focus then is on how the composition of Tamel generates new possibilities and new threats new identifications and new transgressions. As we'll see, Tamil means very different things to different groups of people. Composition is meant to get at this productive encounter between people and place, both materially and semiotically. The place reflects, but also reproduces broader contestations over the meaning and horizons of Nepali identity. It is a conduit for and transmitter of transnational mobilities a symbol of diverse social visions, a product and producer of cultural change. So Tamil really comes into its own in the 1990s. This is when the booming nightlife began to take off and when Tamil attained a reputation for grittiness and transgression. Not coincidentally, this is also the period when Nepali consumers start coming to Tamil a trend that would accelerate until today. So on the screen here, I'm not going to go deeply into these, although hopefully during the Q&A, this is something we can touch on more. But throughout the 1990s, you had a, a series of cultural, economic and political shifts that I think played a deep role in fostering this kind of change. So in 1990, you had the first Jana Andalan, the people's movement, which also coincided with economic liberalization, media liberalization. 
And it also dovetails with this second point, an emergent middle class, which Mark Lichty has written a lot about, which took kind of a consumerist ethos towards middle class performance. You also had the People's War, Civil War, Maoist insurgency from 96 to 2006, which among other effects saw a massive migration from the countryside into Kathmandu. And you also during the 90s saw increasing numbers of Nepalis going abroad and returning. And this has only accelerated since then. Um, so for all these reasons and more, a child born in the late 80s in Kathmandu would have been constituted as a subject in a radically different cultural context from the generations that preceded it. By the turn of the millennium, this generation had begun maturing into teenagers and young adults. The problem was that there were very few places, even at that time in Kathmandu, to live and perform these sorts of lifestyles. But of course, uh, but of course, Tamil already had this sort of infrastructure developing by the 1990s. It was, and in many ways still is, taboo for young Nepalis to come to Tamil as consumers. But after a sharp drop in tourist arrivals in the early 2000s, and especially since the tenuous conclusion of a civil war in 2006, Tamil has become a zone of exception to the cultural norms of Kathmandu, a place to evade and transgress normative roles. Tamil was the hub of a generational transformation, a fun, liberating place to perform new sorts of identities. It is a space in which the normal rules don't seem to apply, or at least where they get partially suspended. At the same time, though, Tamil also produces these emergent life worlds. For example, many people report that Tamil is where they learned to speak English, where they had early sexual and dating encounters, where they were exposed to new fashions and new music. The point is that it is a two-way street. Modern Tamil was produced by cultural shifts and then through spatializing them, fostered those shifts as well. It became an area in which to experience or experiment with alternative modes of being Nepali. It fostered a kind of cosmopolitan openness and its approach to youth culture, not a rejection of being Nepali by any means, but a site for expanding the boundaries of what counts as meaningfully Nepali. One friend, a poet and a performer, put it this way to me, quote, for us, the lanes of Tamil were like a challenge. The moment we came out from that Satgumti to the inner core of Tamil, we had crossed that threshold of our adventure. And what we brought back was amazing because we brought back our music sense. We brought back our reading habits. We brought back the experience, unspoken but seen experience of the travelers. We knew that the world can be traveled. That's what inspired, that's what I'm inspired by. But such transgressive possibilities are not experienced evenly. Thinking about gender is particularly illustrative here because women are subjected to, restrict, to more restrictive expectations than men. Their transgressions into Tamil also entail acute risks while offering similar liberations. For women, Tamil enables and permits fashions and practices largely unacceptable elsewhere. And it simultaneously produces and reinforces the desire, desire to practice a liberated modern Nepali womanhood. But Nepali women in Tamil, particularly those who come alone and or after dark, are also prone to having their respectability called into question. A Nepali woman's body in Tamil is often read a particular way potentially tarnishing her reputation as immodest or immoral. This quote, however, illustrates the sorts of social, or spatial, and cultural shifts that I'm talking about. As one Nepali woman put it to me, quote, if I hadn't come to Tamil, and if my mentality hadn't been changed, I would have been married with two kids by now. But now it is different. Women at my age have already gotten married with kids. The situation in the middle class is that women either go abroad, which is freedom for them, or they stay in Nepal, get married, and work with whatever time they have. Even among my friends, only one is unmarried. I want to draw out two particular aspects of this quote. First, the way that Tom Mill is immediately associated with having her mindset changed and being able to live the sort of life she imagines. 
Second, the particular way Tamel is being deployed here. It is a way for her to navigate between what she sees as the only two options available to a middle-class Nepali woman. On the one hand, the traditional but ultimately confining role of a Nepali housewife versus, on the other hand, a liberating move abroad, but one which relinquishes some sense of Nepaliness. Tamel effectively allows her to straddle these two perceived options, being proudly Nepali and more socially liberated at the same time. And this is an explicitly spatialized designation. Okay, so now I wanna pivot a little bit and talk about if Tamil means all of these things to different groups of people, I wanna now turn to talk about first, what that ambiguity of the space generates and how certain groups are able to sort of leverage that. Um, because Tamil's contested meanings are precisely what enables its subjects transgression. Instead of one cultural map through which people stake out and judge their distinction relative to others, say in a Pierre Bourdieu-like model, Tamel offers a space in which mul multiple social fields overlap, in which one might be playing any number of social games. Every meeting in Tamel is a case of two distinct cultural geographies getting superimposed on one another and coming into tension in the, in the same site. To the extent that one understands these conflicting social fields, other ways of reading bodies in Tamel, one gains leverage to achieve diverse ends. And this is by far a skill most developed among lower class street workers in Tamel, from souvenir touts to hustlers, tour guides to drug dealers. It is through such competence that they attain a certain amount of power and leverage over their class and national others. For example, when workers in Tamel present a particular image of the neighborhood or of Nepal for that matter, to tourists in pursuit of making a sale. This group plays a crucial role in the curation of Tamel, the maintenance of different groups' perceptions and misperceptions of the place. In a very real sense, Tamel and place in general is a practiced effect. So, so far, this has all been concerned with Tamel as sort of internal dynamics with Tamel. But the more time I spent there, the more it became clear that the space is tightly interwoven with transnational sites across a sprawling Nepali diasporic network. To walk down the streets of Tamil is to see countless other spaces brought back by returned Nepalis from travels abroad. The Donner Kebab from a Nepali returned from Switzerland, a Berliner street food restaurant founded by a Nepali couple returned from Germany, a sushi and udon restaurant started by a Nepali who had lived in Japan. The streetscapes of Tamel are not a mirror that passively reflects the rest of the world. They are a map that displays the specific cartographies of departure and return among increasingly mobile Nepalis. But of course, Tamel isn't only a receiver of these transformations, it also transforms city, foreign cities as well. And one easy, though by no means only example of this, is that there are establishments outside Nepal that draw on Tamel through place naming on five different continents, at least. This is, this is not just a matter of simple transplantation or copying. What I'm arguing is that these places are continually reproduced and transformed in relation to one another. They exist in the same transnational sphere of Nepali mobility. They all help compose the ongoing assemblage of Tamel, both materially and imaginatively. When it comes to the name Tamel, young Nepalis are actively drawing upon the neighborhood's cultural cachet within the Nepali diaspora. The case of the Tamel pub in London is a good example. When I asked one of its owners about the name, she said, quote, we used to talk about, we have to make this place as Tamel is, you know, to have that vibe, that ambience. They were explicitly catering to young London-based Nepalis. People had suggested traditional names for their restaurant and they laughed recalling them to me, Vajra, Sherpa, Everest. But, but after knowing that they wanted the Tamel vibe particularly, they decided to call it simply Tamel. The other owner said, quote, there isn't such a hit bar where you can go chill, relax, where you've got live music, where you've got reggae in the background. So when we put the name out there, like Tamel is opening soon, 
I think that was the main reason why people got so excited. Oh, nice, Tom L is here, meaning here in London. These are Nepali sites, but they reflect an emergent sort of Nepaliness. In this way as well, their position in the cultural landscape of their respective cities is analogous to Tom L's place in Kathmandu. In London, there are definitely traditional, quote unquote, traditional Nepali restaurants. And of course, there are plenty of modern bars and foodie restaurants. The same is true of Hong Kong or Melbourne or New York. Several of the Tamil named places that I spoke with made claims at authentic Nepaliness, even after they had just described the inventive types of fusion food they offer. It is seen as Nepali, but Tamil Nepali, which is not quite the same thing as being foreign. As I've tried to suggest, these contestations reflect an ongoing intergenerational rift over the acceptable parameters of Nepali culture. These mobilities are not top-down, west-to-east, or aspatial. In these cases, Nepalis are active engines and the production of new cultural worlds. Tamil, in many ways, is more than just a node in this network of spaces. It is also a sort of cordinal axis. Nepalis living in quintessentially global cities wax nostalgic for Kathmandu. And often, in the Nepali nightlife spaces in Hong Kong or London, they pine for Tamil specifically. The neighborhood is not experienced as a copy of New York or London, as a second-rate version of some imagined elsewhere. It is not a reference to other sites and modes of being, but the referent of a hip cosmopolitan domain. So just to conclude, Tamil's dominant reputation as a tourist place no longer captures the empirical reality, or at least it misses a whole lot. The durability of this narrative reveals a trenchant cultural politics. The diversity of Tamil as an assemblage or as a composition allows Nepalis to creatively, productively navigate new worlds of meaning. All of this in turn gets continuously reconstituted through an array of multiscalar mobilities as Tamil absorbs these journeys and their attendant life worlds. And likewise, as Tamil reshapes those elsewhere geographies. The place is an assemblage, but the meanings and worlds that it indexes are as diverse as the constituent parts that compose it. Taken together, a picture emerges in which multiple mobilities and narratives, what Anand Singh might refer, to as might refer to as contingent lineages, converge in Tamil to produce new modes of being Nepali in the 21st century and new spaces in which to practice those lives.